great to see you all here. And we're, we're hoping to hear more uh, truth and hope in Dave's presentation, and I know we will. And I thank him for stepping up and running for school board, a place that is so needed to have hope and truth presented to students, other than a lot of things they're hearing today. It's so, God's word is totally contrary to what a lot of our students are hearing in the schoolroom today and being exposed to. So I welcome Dave to share those things. And God bless you for running for this position. I encourage you all to vote or have voted already uh, in this very important election. Seems like every time there's election we hear, this is the most pivotal election. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. We've heard that over the last three, four cycles. And I, I guess I have to believe that this is still one of the most important elections. Uh, the phrase gets maybe wore out, but it's that is true. Because unless we stand up like Pat alluded to, you know, we can lose our nation. We can lose the hope that we can be. And it's hard to return to something once you lose it, right? Yeah. right yeah. So continue to pray for those running for office, that the right leaders would be in position, and that hope and truth would come back to our nation. Amen. God bless you. Need them. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you guys. Uh, I was a little concerned about it being hunting opener. And you know, you can fellowship with God in your deer stand, but this has been way better. <laughs> I, uh, I am a hunter, and I'll probably be out this afternoon in my stand, which is fine. And uh, let me just pull this off of here. <clears throat> I'll try to anchor myself a little bit. Are we okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, as was mentioned, I am running for school board. But what I'm going to share with you today isn't because I'm running for school board. It's because it's my life. And the truth that I desire to see people come in contact with uh, every day. And thank you for your testimonies today. Guys, we rub off on people uh, wherever we are at. And you know, what we rub off to others, we want to be good. Now, we all struggle with it sometimes being bad, because we're all men and we're impatient, and you know, we got to get things done. And brothers, you shared about the barge. Oh, man, they might have heard my bad word. <laughs> I was out fishing in the Pacific with my sons one time, and, and uh, had this really floppy tuna on my line, and it came up, and if you tuna, turn a tuna over on its back, uh, they'll settle right down and you can get the hook out easier. Well, this one didn't, and the hook popped out, big treble hook, right into my index finger and out the top knuckle, uh, the middle knuckle. And I used my bad word, and I said to my boys, boys, there you have it. Dad has a bad word. <laughs> I said, we were nine miles offshore, and I said, we're not going home, it's coming back out. <laughs> and I took it out so we didn't ruin the day fishing just because of that. But anyway, brother, I... I take my hat off to you there. So, anyway, uh, I'm from Bemidji now, but uh, I've got a little bit of history about where I'm actually from, and I'm going to use my family to talk about that quickly to introduce us. I have five children, so my wife and I, and five children, the seven of us, the only one born on American soil is my wife. Uh, I was born on Deutschland soil. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. But I don't speak any Deutsch. Sorry. <laughs> My dad was in the military at the time, <clears throat> but the thing is, is when I was 13 years old, I had to go before a citizenship judge in Canada, and my dad wanted to make sure I was sworn in as a Canadian citizen. So I naturalized <laughs> once, and now I've naturalized twice, because now I'm a U.S. citizen, and I'm voting 50-50 so far, just so you know. Uh, we figure that out from 2016 to 2020. Uh, anyway, but uh, my two older boys were born in Canada because I uh, was uh, in Canada at the time. Uh, they're dual citizens. Nowadays, you get that by birth. And then uh, uh, my three younger children were born in Papua New Guinea, just north of Australia, which we'll get into uh, in, for the basis of our talk today. My oldest son's a pilot in the Air Force uh, over in Grand Forks right now. And then, uh, let's see, who's next? This son here is an engineer at Bagley. Um, uh, 
uh, at Team Industries, that I have a stay-at-home mom here who's a stay-at-home busy mom because she's an artist and you can buy her stuff in Hobby Lobby, okay? So she's been, she's got an agent. I want an agent for my books. <laughs> so my kids are outdoing me. That's okay. That's what you train them to do, right? So do you. They look all taller than you. The boys, yes, they're up here. Uh, okay, and then uh, who's next here? Seth here. Uh, he's uh, in Australia now with his wife. He married an Aussie. And uh, they're headed to Perth as we speak to relocate there. And then my youngest daughter right here is, uh, she's rubbing shoulders with the Tampa Bay Lightning hockey team. And I'm like, okay, I'm a Canadian. I gave up hockey to go to the mission field. Here my daughter says, text me, uh, Dad, I just met Victor Hedman. Does anybody, maybe you don't know who Victor Hedman is. He's that big Swedish defenseman, that six foot six on the Tampa Bay Lightning. I said, get out of town. <laughs> oh, then I get another text. Oh, I just gave Steve Stamkos, the captain of the, uh, Tampa Bay Lightning, a tour around the facility that she's the assistant general manager of, and I'm like, will you stop texting me? <laughs> Making me jealous. But anyway, we've invested in our kids so that, you know what, they can take care of themselves, and they're doing it. So we're very thankful for our family. And then my beautiful wife in here, and in this picture I have 11 grandchildren. I now have 12 and a half. One's coming. One's in the oven in Florida down there. Uh, that daughter there is expecting her third now, two weeks after this picture was taken, it's the last time we've been together. Two weeks after that, on August 6, 2020, my wife had a double brain aneurysm. Two weeks after this picture. She died on our bedroom floor. And I want to tell you, well, we had to resuscitate her. So she did, she went into full grand mal seizure. And right away, the emotions, and maybe some of you are widowed here, uh, widowers and you know we prepared for this day because we worked you're gonna see in the jungle at one time and we had to be ready to go see the Lord at any time because over there we had lots of sickness that type of thing and it, it was just part of who we were we were ready to go well here it didn't happen until I'm back in Bemidji in 2020 and uh, right away I said Lord you're allowed to take her and that would be for her too she would she would rather go be with Jesus than be here. Now she lives life to the full here because she lives a win-win life. To win, to go be with Jesus, but she lives a win life here too. Amen. Yeah. My prayer for her, and it's in this book you can get, um, my prayer for her was not that she would survive because I don't want to hold her back and she wouldn't want me to hold her back. My prayer was, Lord, if you do choose to allow her to survive, this was my prayer, that she recovers 100%. Since I wrote that book, we have been in university medical classes because the doctors can explain everything that happened, except that today, she has no residual effects from what happened. Nothing. And I go through that story in there that I started my deaf song, which I learned in the tribe, and it was like God put his hand up and stopped me and says, don't start singing yet. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I brought some books. If you'd like to grab one as a good Christmas present, I have a money back guarantee. If your wife doesn't cry reading it, I'll give you your money back. Just kidding. I won't give you your money back. But <laughs> I can't guarantee you won't cry. But anyway, it's just our story. Many people from my Facebook post just said, will you tell us the whole story? And so that covers the 19 days, 17 days in ICU, and then being released out the door of the hospital with, we didn't even have to go to rehab. The doctors were just, it, they're just blown away. Anyway. Yeah, we're, we're uh, she's a walking miracle. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she's my best friend. 35 years we've been married, so. Anyway, that's the book there, but I want to give you some context of where we worked for 20 years. I was a linguist with a mission group in a, a tribe in Papua New Guinea, which is just north of Australia. And uh, my son's moving right to there, by the way, to Perth. He was down in Tasmania. They're moving to Perth. 
Um, anyway, so for 20 years we lived in Papua New Guinea, and uh, I was working with this tribe there. And if you zoom in on Papua New Guinea, I was right in this area right there uh, in a tribe that uh, we were out in the sticks. I mean, I ran the rivers a lot. I've got a few stories for you. <laughs> uh, and uh, 300, in, 300 inches of rain in the area that we were in, so the water was up and down all the time. I saw it go three weeks without raining one time. And uh, then you got to be real careful, gravel bars and snags in the water and everything. And then when it's really high, you got to watch floating stuff. You know, it's, it was really quite an adventure. Anyway, in close to that, uh, we were about a 45-minute uh, Cessna flight to an airstrip that we could take our supplies into and, and supply in and out of, and eventually we put in our own airstrip uh, in this location. We were invited in by the people uh, we're that uh, at their request to go in and live with them and learn their language and culture and get to know them, so that's what we did. We went in and, and uh, lived with them all those years. Uh, in close here, uh, my son that's in the Air Force sent me this picture and I was like, where did you get that picture? It's so clear. This is my house right here, or my office, and then my coworkers each had the houses in there. And uh, I was just like, wow, that is so crystal clear. This is, I can't tell you how remote this is. I mean, it, it, this is way out in the sticks. And uh, anyway, it's pretty excited about that picture. Now. I have continued to do, I actually started writing before this incident happened, I, and I stopped and wrote this book, but I, I'm just finishing my edits on the first part of the trilogy I'm writing about our tribe coming out of cannibalism and meeting the modern world. And it's gonna be a three-part series. The first part, I have 50 pages left on my edits, and then I'm going to an agent with it, is about when the Australians went into the area to get the cannibalism and fighting stuff. And it's an unbelievable story that uh, I learned sitting around the fires with them at night and learning their culture and the language and getting fluent in their language so I could really understand and listening to the older guys who give you all the unedited stuff. And uh, it was quite a learning experience, learning about all that. This is my adopted brother, Hedy. He um, does have a pen through his nose. He fit in right here right now. I mean, I see things in people's noses all the time now. <laughs> I showed him a picture one, guy, one time of somebody with piercings all over their faces, and they said, that's what we used to do when we ate each other. It's like, yeah, we're, we got a problem, folks, in our culture. Anyway, so <clears throat> that's my brother, uh, Hedy, and my older brother, I was adopted into his clan, the Te Thali people, uh, you know, that clan within the language group, and uh, we're the Kokomo line, which is a big, or uh, hornbill line, we call it. And uh, I had five brothers that I got adopted into their, to their group. And uh, so my books are written from his perspective and him telling me stuff and of course learning a lot in there. Uh, but I write it from his perspective because he was the first one to meet the white man. And uh, they call him the painted man. See, they're black, we're painted. So, yeah, right? And uh, that's, every, it's all from your perspective, right? There you go. So anyway, uh, the second book will be about them stepping out to plantation work, which was not slavery. It was, they were volunteers to go out and work at plantations. But when they left the tribe, I mean, they're in their grass skirts and gourds and things in their nose and that, that monolingual still, that means they only spoke their tribal language. Every step they took was a change. Every single step. And that's the second story, uh, book is about them stepping out of their culture and then the third book will be about, invite, I call it invited, at what expense invited in is them inviting us into the tribe and us learning their language and just that whole journey with them. So I got a bit of work ahead of me, obviously, that I do at five in the morning uh, to, get, to get it done. And I call the trilogy at what expense because we're gonna get into some stuff here that, that change has expense to it. For all of us, doesn't matter what color you are, where you're from, anything. If you're gonna have some change, there's gonna be some expense to it, okay? That's good to remember uh, those things. All right, and then uh, I have a fourth book uh, on, the, on the books, if you wanna say. Just, it's just gonna be a collection of short, I've got so many crazy stories, so I'm funny, but 
I want to use them to encourage people. It's, I'm just going to call it uh, seeds from the jungle for encouragement to the soul. That'll be down the road a little bit. All right. So moving on from that and understanding a little bit of my background, uh, we have some issues going on, and I'm just going to start throwing them up here, don't we? We've got CRT, which some of you might not even know. That means critical race theory. We've got things called white guilt, white fragility, equality issues that are being talked about, uh, equity, uh, and then racism, implicit bias, and then anti-racism. Is anybody a little bit confused out there? Like, you're not... Does anybody feel like your thoughts are somewhat uh, convoluted in that, should I be feeling guilty today? Like, should I be, what, where am I at in all this? Like, and you know, if, if you do watch a lot of TV, certain stations, you know what, it's coming right between the eyes, isn't it? And uh, we need to understand what's going on with that. And I, I so appreciate the word truth being said up here today. We need to anchor our hearts to the truth. Then we'll be able to stand in that armor. And that's what it tells us to do is stand. And what will the devil do? Flee. He'll flee. Yeah. That's the promise there. Yeah. And later on in James, that's from James, it also talks about a garrison. The Greek word is a garrison. How many soldiers were in a garrison? Anybody know? I teach Sunday mornings and we, we're now in Peter, but we were in James. Thousand? Two thousand? It's however many are needed. <laughs> and what does it say there? Is the Lord is your garrison. Oh, that is just that's so rich. Because we only need God. Right? But you feel like all these issues are coming at you and uh, there's this gender dysphoria thing, which you know I will say right now is a fad. What do fads do? Go away. But this fad's going to leave scars, like literal physical scars, right? And uh, I'm not going to get into that so much today. I'm going to talk about some of the other ones. Um, and then there's hockey. I, I think that. Got an issue with hockey? You better talk to me. And for those of you that need it, I mean ice hockey. Now, here in the north, and especially in Canada, there's only one kind of hockey, right? It's redundant to say ice hockey, just so you know, a little Canadian language coming out. All right, so as we look at all these things and try and sort out in our mind, like, what is true? Am I staying in the thing there? No. No, I'm not. See there? <laughs> uh, let's go like this. And I'll stay in the middle here. Sorry, that's, maybe that's scary. All right. Let's first of all, with our group here today, because I can, let's talk about the biblical foundation. Let's talk about some of that. Where is that anchor for us? Let's go here to Romans 3, 22 and 24, and I'll put it up here. Um, you can look it up if you want. These are very familiar verses to us, and my wife and I have been reading through Romans lately. <clears throat> and I'll, We can go about one paragraph, and we just have to stop and talk, because <laughs> it's like... It's so rich, all right? It says this. Have you thought, put this in the light of what we're facing right now. There is no difference in what? In all of us. There's no difference. Use the word of God to frame, your, to, to, to frame what you're thinking about out in the world. That's your filter. It's already in there. Equality is already set. Right there. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory, glory of God. What does that mean? We're all on the same ground. Doesn't matter your color. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter what language you speak. Anything. We're all on the same level here. That's biblical equality. Right there. Okay? And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What is that? That's your equity. If you look at the context of Romans there, it talks about accounting. And you cannot put a balance of goodness on your side of the balance sheet. Amen. It doesn't say good works. 
No, it doesn't. You can't do that. Go back to Genesis chapter three, uh, 2 and 3 when God put man in the garden and gave him everything. Amen. Only God can give you equity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in the balance sheet of our lives, which needs righteousness before God, we have sin. But it says he replaces that in a just way. And God puts that equity in there for us and makes us what? Acceptable to him. Wow, that's powerful. Okay? So this is our biblical foundation for what we're going to go on and talk about here. Okay? This is so, so important. And this is, the scripture is full of this. I, it's just Romans 3, we really do know. And, it, and, and somebody said you go back and, yeah, you said you, you go back and read it again. You look at your notes and then you've learned something new. It, this is taking scripture and making it applicable to your current circumstances because it hasn't changed but the circumstances are okay? <laughs> alright I want to talk a little bit about culture <clears throat> and uh, as we move on here and talk about some of these issues you're going to see why I'm talking about culture okay let's talk about pointing for a minute how do we, how do we point in our culture I already heard it said, with your finger. Do you know that's very rude in a lot of other cultures? That's super rude. In the tribe I worked in, you would never point with your finger, ever. You just don't do it. I, I can't remember one time somebody pointing, whether it was a direction up river, down river, across the river, at somebody, to, to their house, to anything, I don't remember ever using a finger to point. <laughs> totally rude. Not so much in our culture, although I think our moms and dads always quit pointing, quit pointing. But we still do it, right? Well, what did they do in the tribe I'm from? I was working in. Uh, they used their bottom lip. There's my wife. Over there. Right leg thing. Yeah. Brother, you're gonna hear a lot about how similar <laughs> tribal culture is 7,000 miles away from here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, you use your lip, your bottom lip. Now, I tell my granddaughter, don't stick out your bottom lip, a birdie's gonna poop on it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why, because in our culture, the lip comes out on the bottom, what's that indicating? What's that communicating? Displeasure, anger, you know, I, I'm not getting my way. Well, in the tribe, that's how they point. You know what, coffee's over there. Try it, come on, try it guys. Everybody point to the coffee. It's over there. Are these getting to the same place, though? Like, accomplishing the same thing? Yeah. So which one's right or wrong? Both. They're both fine. You know? They are. <laughs> but sometimes you get a little... Yeah, that was in Germany. You get, you always point the finger and get angry. Yeah, okay. There you go. So, let's try another one. How about counting? Everybody put your hand up. I want you to count to five on your fingers for me. Come on, do it. Exercise. One, well, you might start with the index finger, depending where you're from. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, keep it up there. So I'm gonna have you put your other hand up. But quickly, I spoke to a group of professional accountants one time. Uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, big firm. They've got a, a big office in downtown London and they have franchises all over the world. They were having struggles with their foreign accountants and their Papua New Guinea accountants. All qualified to be there, all do the same thing, but they're having some culture issues between them. So I spoke to the group and I said, okay, you guys from New Zealand, South Africa, England, get your hand up just like you guys if you get tight and put it down. But I said, I want you to count on your fingers. This is the first thing I did when I went in there. Okay, Papua New Guinea accountants, put up your hand, count to five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> exactly the opposite, okay? So what we do is we have a hand out when we get to five, they have a hand in. Now I have a saying from when I was a kid, see my finger, see my thumb, see my fist, you better run, because that's what I'm communicating to you, right? <laughs> Which way gets to five? They both get to five. This is culture. It's, it, 
a different way of doing things to get the same result. Why is that important? Well, you're gonna continue to see this. All right, courtesy. Now, most of us, I couldn't even find, well, I could probably find a picture of a guy opening a door for a girl, but, you know, nowadays, saying I'm weaker, you know, kind of thing, like, no, I have respect for you, so I want you to go in the door first. And do it by yourself. Okay, you know? Yeah, or do it myself, or I'll just walk in in front of you and not even acknowledge that you're a human being. Well, most of us, I'm pretty sure, grew up learning that, you know what, open the door, let the lady go through first, that's respectful. It's not that she's weak and can't open the door. No, my wife can open the door. You bet, and her sister even more. Anyway, uh, so that's what we grew up with. That's what, that's our culture, okay? Well, in the tribe, here comes, this is my mother in the tribe, one of my mothers. <laughs> She's got this big old stack of firewood on her back and another full one underneath in that bark bag. And if she had young children, there'd be a bag in there with a kid in it probably. And she's walking, you know, back from gathering wood, that kind of thing. And her husband will be out in front of her walking like this, just always in front. <laughs> well, through my cultural experience, I'm saying, dude, let me teach you a few things. <laughs> like, help her carry the load. Okay, that's from my cultural standpoint, right? I, I'm gonna carry the heavy load for my wife. In their culture, the underlying thinking is, well, if I got the load and a wild pig or a cassowary or something comes in right out onto the trail, how am I gonna protect my wife? Good point, point. and it's true, it's there. They, now, I'm not saying women have a lot of rights in the tribe, that's another whole issue. But, the men will have a little bag on and their big machete and be walking ahead of the women. Because they want to be able to take care of danger, if danger comes. So a different way of thinking. You don't learn that the first day you're in there, you're sorting through all your cultural grid <coughs> issues, but anyway. All right, so which way of things was doing, uh, which way of doing things is right or wrong? There isn't a right or wrong. They got to the same objective, okay? And I'm just showing you a few illustrations. There are lots of illustrations from other cultures. Why do we feel uncomfortable or critical of a different way of doing things? Because it's different than what we know. That's why, you know, it, it, it's just plain different. And you can struggle in that. I work with hunter-gatherers, and I took a friend over there one time, and after a week of being in there, he just said to me, he goes, man, these people are lazy. I said, well, let's talk about it. Why, what have you observed in the culture? Because when you're there new, you observe everything, right? Well, they're just laying around. I said, okay. Let's talk about a few things. Number one, I'm here visiting. They haven't seen me for several years. Everybody wants to be in the village because Dave's there, right? And uh, have a good time together. Number two, if a hunter-gatherer is laying around, what it means is they're not hungry. They have to eat. But they live in the jungle, which if you want big meat, you go hunt it. Or you plant a garden, and our people were ultra hunter-gatherers. Their gardens weren't that great. And it, you can grow bananas anywhere and they had lots of bananas, all kinds of things. But if they wanted protein, they had to go fishing, they had to go hunting, whatever they wanted. If they're laying around the village, it's because they're not hungry. Important principle. Don't call somebody lazy until you know what their mentality is. And I'll tell you what, I know firsthand that they can work me into the ground when they're hungry. Oh my goodness. You want, I learned to pig hunt. And to start with, they treated me like a, a sissy until I finally said, I'm going with the dogs right behind the lead guy and I got to kill a pig. But they were afraid I'd get hurt and they, they said, what are you wearing those big boots for in the jungle? I said, well, I don't have feet like you guys. They go barefoot, I got like baby's feet. And they just all laughed. Well, how are you gonna get a tr up a tree with those boots on and I said well what do you mean get up a tree and they said because when a boar comes along he doesn't care what color you are you're going down <laughs> right 
we get up a tree. <laughs> there are lots of trees to get up. You can get up a one you can climb. I said, well, you just watch me with my boots on. But anyway, different way of thinking. How do we accept and appreciate another culture's way of doing things? Those, that's a good question. How do we do that? Um, it, it takes some exercise. It takes some thinking about it. And, it, and as we progress here, we're, I'm going to offer you some solutions to those things. But we have to ask ourselves the question is, what they think? Is that OK? Is it, is it fine? All right. So that brings us to this question of, well, what is racism? Because we're being told, you know, I might have an implicit bias, or I might have this. Well, I have a cultural way of doing things, and I'm just a normal person that sometimes it bothers me what other cultures do. Is that, is that, is that wrong? I don't think that's wrong so much as it is, well, what are you going to do with that in the long run? Okay? So, but we're hearing this word racism so much, and uh, nowadays, it's everything. It's what you do or don't say. I've been told that. If I don't say this, I'm racist. Or if I do say this, I'm, okay, well, how does that work? It's what you do or don't do. Anybody notice that? Like, it doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You're a racist, okay? What you look at or what you don't look at. You know, there are times I'm like, I'm afraid to, I mean, I'm just, I accept the fact that I'm not a good looking guy, but when I'm looking at you and I'm not smiling, does that mean I'm mad at you and your culture and the way you do things? Come on, no. I can't, I mean, I, I have this heavy eyebrow and I'm not mad at you just looking at me, come on. <laughs> You'll know if I'm mad at you because I'm a hockey player. Right? All right. <laughs> But what is a practical or construction definition of racism that will help us understand what is coming our way so much these days? And this is what I'm going to say. Racism is the perception. Wait, I'm going to cross that out. Perception has carries some innocence to it. I have a perception of the way you're doing things, probably because I don't know why you're doing it or that it's your culture. Or like if someone's sticking their lip out at you, what are you going to think if you're not familiar with that? Well, if I had one of my tribal buddies here and he says, well, who's that guy with a, what, I said, what guy? This guy with a, and you see him do that at you, I mean, what are you going to think? Like, think I got a beef with me or like, what's going on? All right, so perception is not the word to use. I like the word mindset. Racism is the mindset that someone is inferior to yourself because of differences in culture. Differences in skin color or ethnic origin. The mindset is further expressed in intentional behaviors. Intentional, not accidental or oblivious to what's going on or whatever. No, intentional behaviors intended to limit or stifle the progress of other, another individual or groups. We did have a problem with this at one time in our culture. Actually, it was only a certain group of people in our culture that had a problem with that endorsed slavery back in the day. Don't, not every white person 200 years ago owned slaves, okay? That's misinformation, okay? You could live up north and you were just fine. And not every person in the south owned slaves either. Oftentimes it was an, it's the elite, the, the wealthy did, okay, whatever. So, but I like this definition because it brings it down to, okay, what is my mindset? Do I, have, do I have issues with a certain group that I'm not willing to take the time to understand? Or am I preventing them? Am I standing in the way of them having opportunities to better themselves or whatever it is? Okay? All right. Well, that leads us to then what is equality? Okay? It's not based on culture because there are different ways of doing things. It's not based on language because there are different ways of speaking. I had to flip my brain around to understand tribal speaking. Now language and culture go hand in hand. They would say so many things that were completely the opposite. Even like if somebody called me a skinhead, that meant I was stupid. What do we say in our culture? Bonehead. I mean, just that was completely the opposite. <laughs> you, 
And there's a plethora of examples like that, that I, I had to flip my thinking, okay? So it's not based on language, and it's not based on color, because we all bleed gray. And I often said, traveling around uh, New Guinea, when I would, I, you know, people would be talking to me, and, and the issue of, it, it, they wanted me to be the great white guy, really. I said, why don't you get your knife out? You get my knife, why? And I said, because I want you to cut my arm and see what color I bleed. And then I'm gonna cut your arm and see what color you bleed, and we're gonna compare. Dr. Ben Carson is quoted as saying, of the thousands of brains he, he worked on, of every color and ethnicity you can imagine, all the brains were gray, right? This is just a wrapper on the outside. We all bleed the same color. Equality is a basic attitude of valuing and respecting another human being, period. Our biblical foundation in that we know we've, we have a biblical foundation, but we can have a cultural foundation in this too of the fact that because you're a human being, you automatically have value and respect from me. And that whether you deserve it or not, that's not what we're answering here. We're answering you're a human being. You have value and respect. That is equality. And that and you're gonna see as I get into this, that's what our Constitution guarantees, right? All right, so this valuing of others will then dictate our behavior towards others. So when I meet someone from another country, now, of course I am, have a background in linguistics and anthropology, I always take interest in somebody I know from another country, place on the earth. But we can exercise that too. Why, because it comes from our mindset that they're equal to me. They are. All right. Equality is intri intrinsic and God-given, therefore, unconditional. Okay? So value, we have to have equal value for each other. Now, quickly, on this, house building in the tribe. They build a house every two years. It's a biodegradable culture. Okay? Which means everything they do in their culture deteriorates. <laughs> They don't have a mentality for maintenance. It's not a virtue of this, their culture, right? We build a house that's gonna last, well, it's an investment, because we're gonna make money out of something. That's, that's our culture, it's gotta last. Not there, every two years. And before they had steel tools, they used even smaller, they really built the whole thing out of little sticks, because they couldn't cut trees down big enough to build a house good sized posts, that kind of thing, okay? Well, then I built my house in the tribe. <laughs> it was just a 28 by 40 floor. The pitch, 18 feet, because I, I, had, I put thatch on it to begin with. I had to get that three inches, 300 inches of rain off every year, right? Mm -hmm. They're standing there like, wow. You know, seeing that frame, and so I stood there and looked at it with them, and see, in their minds, they didn't want us to be equal. They wanted me to be the great white man so that they could benefit materially. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what they wanted. We're gonna get into equity a little bit here, but they really wanted me to be up here so that I could take care of their equity problem. <laughs> so I said, okay guys, well, take a good look at it. And then I asked them, where, where's the border of where the sun goes down on your property? And they said, oh, you see those, you can't see them in this picture, but they're over here. They're, see those two mountains over there? That's, that's where the sun goes down. That's our land border. And then if you turn around and look up forever, well, you can't actually see our border. That's our land. This, this is incredible land. Everything they need is right at their fingertips. So I said, okay, turn around, look at my house. I don't own any land in America. And they just all laughed. Ah, you got your dad's land, you know? So what are they doing? They're thinking of their cultural perspective where it's all passed down, okay? I said, you're not gonna understand this, but if I want my father's land, I'm probably gonna have to buy it from him. Now there is some inheritance with the, you know, some tax that goes along with it and that type of thing. It's not like you're getting it for free. 
Okay? But I did not have any titled land in my name in, in North America, which means I don't have any land. They, they were, they just, they couldn't believe that. And you know what started happening? They started understanding, I had no identity because I had no land. And it, and it started to help them equalize me with them, especially the land, because I had no identity to me. And they were like, wow. And I said, you, you've got, they have quila. Quila is an ironwood. Many species of it. I mean, that, that, I could retire on a tree of quila. They've got oil underneath it, natural gas. In the mountains, they've got gold. So who's rich? Not me. They are. They just don't understand it. They don't see it that way, right? Anyway, so I said, look at my house. And it started helping us see each other on ground level. And eventually we got to the place where it didn't matter that I had shoes and glasses and a watch and a boat motor. It didn't matter what I owned. We became equal in each other's eyes. Hugely important. But I had to work for it. I had to get to the place and take every opportunity, like with my house, to help them understand I value you no matter what you have. Okay? So, our value became equal of each other. Well, then let's go to equity. What is equity? Basic definition is a state or quality of just being, of being just or fair. You look it up, that's what it says. I think they're kind of mixing that up somehow now. Okay? Yeah. This is based on culture. Equity is. Because there are different ways of doing things. See how it's the opposite of equality? Equity is based on culture because how you feed yourself in a hunter-gatherer culture is very different how you feed yourself in an industrial culture. Right? I, take, I get a job to earn money to buy food. In the tribe, you go hunting with your dogs and kill pigs. It doesn't cost you anything except a little elbow grease. But mine's the same way is in that sense is I've got to get out of bed and go work to earn a living, to build my equity, okay? This is based on individual re freedom and responsibility, which in our culture is, why is America the number one country in the world? Because you have the freedom to build your equity. You can be what you want to be. You can be a riverboat man. You can be a soldier. You can be an accountant. You can be whatever you want to go after. We're guaranteed equality, because that's not based on this. But your equity, you're going to have to build on your own. It's a personal thing, okay? This cannot be forced on a group of people or an individual, no matter which side of the spectrum you're on. It's not just and fair to force it on those that have a lot. It's not just and fair to force it on those that don't have a lot. That's not what's being told to us today. We're being told they need to have equal equity. No, because we're different. Some people have, they have abilities to make money. I marvel at them. doesn't mean you take his and put it over here, okay? But when you build your personal equity, it gives you the opportunity to perform charity. Charity is to be free will. Are we all greedy? Yes, we're all greedy. But if you understand that you have the ability to give to another and are not forced to do it, you will do it. And in America, we are the most generous nation on earth. Trust me, I've been around the world three times. I've been in a lot of places, don't have as much as America, and they're not generous. We are the most generous nation on earth. 
Your socialist, more social style governments are not as generous as America. Why? Because we have the freedom to give whether we want to or not. It's a good thing to give. Sure is. But if I'm going to force you to give, you think you're going to give one more cent than you? No, you're not. Okay. Equity is not a guaranteed right. You don't have a right that you're going to have a balance in your bank account. That's not a right. Okay. <clears throat> so it's who you are equals what you have. This is not popular right now. <laughs> who you are equals what you have. So I have this really scientific formula for you. It's called bucket mint. <coughs> so I went into the tribe and they perceived that my bucket was full and overflowing. Am I a rich man in America? Are you kidding? No. Wealth is relative to your perception of who has the, the wealth. Okay? So the perception was I had this really full bucket, and what did they want to do? Have me fill up their buckets. So they had the equality wrong because they wanted me to stay being the white man, the rich, filthy stinking rich white man. And they wanted me to take my equity and fill up their buckets. Not just the one bucket, all their buckets. Seriously, we dealt with this every single day. They would ask me, hey, Red, call me Red, which can mean muscle, but I think it's just red hair. Anyway, uh, they, they, uh, they, all the time, you got any uh, canned fish in the house? I could have some? That's what they'd ask me. The guilt, the guilt. I had to learn to say no. I don't have any fish to give you. Did I have fish in the house? Yes, but you know what? I can't go to the jungle and hunt pigs like they can. I tried and I learned, why? To feed my family, we'd all be dead, <laughs> okay? But because I had it, they asked for it. And we had to learn to say no. Very hard on the wives. I could put it in my box over here and just say no. I don't have any fish to give you. Right? But the wives, it's really hard on them. And every day my wife struggled with this guilt. But our guilt could not let us, could not affect the decisions we were making in our, in our job there. Why? Because I could open the door and say to everybody, come on in and have three square a day. That would have stolen from them the ability to look after themselves, which they had done for centuries, but all of a sudden I feel guilty, so I'm just gonna put the food on the table. And with a hunter-gatherer, and I will say this, if you put the food on the table for a hunter-gatherer, the only exercise they will do is lifting it up to get it into their mouth. Remember the fellow that thought everybody was lazy? I said, they're not hungry. But if they're not hungry because I'm feeding them, that is wrong. That's not just and fair because I'm stealing a lifestyle from them. You see that? But my guilt was so strong and we'd have team members as I do consultant work. I feel so much better if I just give them stuff. And I said, yeah, but someday when you're not there to give them stuff, they will no longer like you. And I saw that happen, okay? So equity, they, that's what they wanted to do. Your bucket may not be as full as my bucket. Hmm, okay. Think of your house, your vehicle, or business, or the equity, and the equity that you have in it. You, if, you, if you have equity in your house, and I don't have as much equity, Hey, can you give me some of your equity and fill up my house? You know, it, it, it's that simple. I would say, well, no. <laughs> right? Uh, my bucket and your bucket. In the tribe, it was my bucket and their buckets. Equity is better earned than given. I'm not the tallest hockey player in the world. I wanted to be six foot two like my uncles that got drafted in the NHL and some of my cousins. On my mom's side, they're all big boys. 
And my dad says, well, I can't cut someone else's legs off and give them to you, baby. Was that true? That's the truth. But here's what you can do, is you pretend you got eggs in pockets on your hips, and you learn to skate faster than those big boys. And what did my dad teach me? He taught me how to build my equity as a hockey player. He could not give that to me. I had to work for it. So in college, I ran extra. I trained extra. I used to go figure skate at public skates. Not, I didn't have my, I had my hockey skates on, but I go practicing balance all the time. I did what I had to do to get to the place where I could outskate everybody. And it built my equity as a hockey player. Same thing. I can't give you someone else's legs, baby. It doesn't work that way. You gotta build it. If you want it, and this is what we started saying to the tribal people, if you want a boat motor, let me show you how to get a boat motor. We taught them how to read and write. We made an alphabet for them, taught them to read and write their own language. Biggest, biggest, excuse me, biggest tool for building equity is learning how to read and write. Because out in the city then, they wouldn't be taken advantage of. They're just dumb bush buddies, you know? All right, equity is about your character and lifestyle choices. <gasps> Yeah, but I'm a victim of, don't use that word with me. You've got to stop looking at yourself like a victim. Okay? I, I, there are terrible stories out there, and there are a lot of people I'd like to take out behind the woodshed that are the cause of some of those stories, right? But you stand up and take control, okay? Now the takeaway from this is this is all in the Constitution. I did not have the school board on my radar three months ago, but somebody came to me and just said, Dave, we believe you need to run. You can articulate your views, you are solid in them, and you believe them. And are, you're, you're willing to stand up? And I said, oh man, I don't have any kids in school. Yeah, but I got 12 grandkids, uh, you know. And my wife and I prayed about it for many weeks before, and I had to file on, I think it was August 2nd. I'm just like, wow, I, I don't know. I'm a twice naturalized citizen. I've lived around the world. We have a document from our founding fathers here that is like no other country on earth. It gives us, it, it protects the God-given inalienable rights and protects those. This doesn't give us those rights. This protects them, right? And this, this is being attacked like none of That's really what's going on here. I, yes, I do believe it's a spiritual battle overall. Don't get me wrong there. But when you have a shining light that has impacted the world for in many different ways in this country, it's gonna get attacked. And it's coming from within. People are like, it's just an old document. Well, there's, there, it's written in there. If you need to change something, there's a process to change it. But it's not able to be done overnight because you don't want the mob changing things. You don't want, that's why we're not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, where it takes time to change some of the great values that are in place. What's the 14th Amendment? It was a change for slavery. They had to do that. Absolutely. I'm not opposed to change. I'm opposed to how you change it. And bottom line is, this is based on a Judeo-Christian value system, which means you don't have to agree with the Judeo-Christian value system or believe it even. That's the beauty of this. You don't have to believe it, but you have to agree in the public square that this is our moral compass, our foundation for operating is based on this. You won't get that in any other belief system in the world. You will not, okay? All right, so this is framed on a Judeo-Christian value system. This is what's being undermined today. Yes, 
very, very strategically. It, it, if you talk to somebody and they're ashamed of the United States, somebody's been filling their head with mush. Have we done things wrong? Absolutely. But if you cannot honestly look at the trajectory of this nation and how it's righted some of the wrongs it had in the beginning, you're blind. You're being told untruth. Okay? We are one nation under God. Everybody is, every citizen has equality. Guaranteed that. With liberty for all. You can live wherever you want in this country. Okay? With justice for all. You want to see what they're hammering now? It's the justice system. The, and it is slick. If you stand on the Constitution, you have justice. Okay? And then, of course, I want to remind you of our biblical foundation here. Just to wrap this up. We are all equal in God's eyes. <laughs> and, and without Jesus... Our equity column, our balance sheet, is in the red. We're hurting. And only God can fix that and give us that balance of righteousness through the finished work of Christ that satisfies a holy and just God. So make sure you got that balance in your balance sheet, all right? Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.